I thank God for the privilege of being able to call John Mark and Alicia Bartlett our friends. <laughs> I'm grateful for their family, and uh, I'm so thankful that my wife Brenda and I have many others in this congregation uh, that we're able to speak with and pray with and learn from periodically. I wouldn't begin to call all of the names. I will miss someone, so I will only call the most popular ones, John, Mark, and Lisa. <laughs> but so many friends, so many prayer partners. Uh, but even more than friends, these and all of you, all of you are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And, you know, the in Christ is important. You are the family that I will be with for all eternity. So you have to get along with me because you can't get rid of me. Uh, because of Christ, we're here to celebrate what God has done to recognize that till now, the Lord has helped us. In a few minutes, I want to continue our gratitude to God for that help from the word of the Lord in 1 Samuel, but I want to first recall some things that God has done and how that's led us to this point tonight as we officially recognize several people whom God has called to be the elders and the deacons for the Grace Workshop Ministries. Six years ago, by God's grace, John Mark Bartlett was called out of where he was in order to lead a congregation of people in worship. And although he and Lisa and many of us did not understand it at that time, we now know that this was an act of God's grace. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Pastor Bartlett's obvious gift is one of teaching the Word of God, but greater still, God has gifted him with the burning desire to be faithful to the Word of God. And this is evident not just in his teaching, but in his lifestyle of repentance and faithfulness. And God has brought each and every one of you here today, those who are part of the Grace Workshop Ministries congregation, because he has also given you or gifted you with the desire to be faithful to the Word of God. I've seen this evidenced. Uh, in the way that lives here have been transformed according to the grace of God. Uh, I've seen it evidence in the way that we are now attempting to live lives dependent on the grace of God, to pursue sanctification, not out of guilt or a desire to earn our way to God, but because of the revelation of the great love that God has set upon you by choosing you to be his from before the foundation of the world. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. It is the grace of God that lovingly teaches and trains us to live in a way that glorifies and honors our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is the grace of God that gives us hope for the return of the one who chose us to be his people. And on this, your sixth anniversary of worshiping together, 
as the Grace Workshop Ministries in Kingston, Jamaica, I just want to remind you today about the grace of God. Amen. Uh, this is why in this Jubilee we must remember till now the Lord has helped us. It's a time to remember that we're here not by our strength, not by our ingenuity, uh, not by our strength of character, not by our willpower, not by the power of any man. We're here by the strength that God supplies by His grace. And although it was Pastor John Mark Bartlett that God has initially called by His grace to lead and love this congregation, especially through the preaching the faithful preaching and teaching of the Word of God, thank God he has not been called to lead this congregation alone. Through the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit, Paul the Apostle likens all of you, all of you, the church, to a physical body. In 1 Corinthians 12 verse 14, he says, the body does not consist of one member, but many. He writes in verse 18, but as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. So in the early days of the church, God first set the church in order through the apostles and the prophets. Then establishing teachers those who would use the Word of God to shepherd the people of God, and then those who would use their various gifts in administrating and healing, physical, mental, and emotional healing, and helping, and even bringing clarity in understanding the Word of God through translation from various languages. Paul goes on to say that God so composed the body that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And so very early in the life of the church, we see in Acts chapter 6, the church is growing rapidly. One translation says the church is growing in leaps and bounds, and God used a, a situation that could have caused great division in the church in order to bring his established leadership and ministering structure to the church body. You see, the church was attending to the felt needs of the congregation, the physical and the social needs. They were ensuring that the widows among them had enough to eat, but the Greek-speaking widows were being neglected, and it threatened the unity of the church. The context in Acts chapter 6 implies to us that it was the elders who were actually overseeing the daily distribution of the food, but with a growing church, it became far too much for them to do. And so they pulled all the disciples together and they said, it's not right, it's not acceptable that we should neglect, that we should give up even the primary thing that God has called us to do which is to feed the people of God by faithfully preaching and teaching the Word of God, of leading the church through dependence on God in consistent prayer. They said, we need help. And so the office of the deacon, responsible for the creation of and the administration of systems and processes with a heart for attending to the needs of the people was made official in the church of Jesus Christ. And so tonight, we strive to maintain fidelity to the Word of God through, number one, the recognition of the priesthood of all believers, all of us who have been filled with the Holy Spirit, been called by Jesus Christ. We need no mediator but Jesus Christ Himself. Amen? We can all boldly go to the throne of grace and find mercy in our time of need. And we can fulfill the glorious privilege of serving in the church because the Holy Spirit has empowered us to do so. So, so we strive to maintain fidelity to the Word of God through that, but also, number two, through the recognition of the ministry of the elders, whose main role it is to pastor 
or shepherd the people of God through preaching, teaching, praying, protecting, and overseeing the care of the people of God in a local congregation. And number three, we also strive to maintain fidelity to the Word of God through the recognition of the ministry of the deacons who assist the elders by helping them to maintain their focus on the Word of God and whose ministry of service impacts the various needs of the body, both in the congregation of the saints and that, that love of the body of Christ that extends into the community as well. They are the very hands and feet of Jesus touching the saints and those whom God is calling to be his. Amen? So this is the point to which God has brought us. We remember the great things he has done for us to this point, and by God's grace, we're going to remember this day in the life of this church. So, congregation of the Grace Workshop Ministries, uh, before we bring these elders and deacons who sit before me and before you, we want to go back to the Word of God for a few minutes. In 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 12, and I just want to speak to us for a few minutes about remembering the great things that God has done. Remembering the great things that God has done. First Samuel, as we heard just last night, is an intimate look into the life of a people and the, and the God who has decided to set his divine love upon them. And yesterday, uh, Elder Roshane Ricketts so aptly preached to us from chapter 7 about how important remembering can be to helping us and how hurtful forgetting what God has done can be. And it was so in chapter 7 for the people of Israel. We're going to see in chapter 12, before I read the text, we're going to see then in chapter 12 that Samuel the prophet is giving his final address as the official judge over all Israel. See, what happened is Saul, the first official king of Israel, has already been anointed king. So Samuel is reluctantly, but obediently, he's stepping aside to give way to what the people have asked for, a king like all the other nations around them. Now, there was nothing wrong with the people asking for a king. Nothing wrong. The problem was that they wanted a king like the other nations. One that they could point to and say, he saved us. One that they could point to and celebrate when in fact it was God who fought their battles for them. So may we never forget, till now, the Lord has helped us. Amen? So as Samuel gives his final address, Chapter 12, you'll read in about verses 1 to 14, he first reminds the people that God has given him to them as a faithful judge. He reminds them and they agree that he has not defrauded anybody. He hasn't taken any bribes. He hasn't oppressed anybody. He hasn't used power that he wasn't supposed to. He reminded them of the righteous deeds that God has done for them even though they didn't have a king. He told them how God delivered them from Egypt by Moses and Aaron, delivered them again from the Moabites and from the Philistines, most recently from the Ammonites. But one thing that characterized these people whom the almighty God of the universe had decided to set his love upon, they would constantly forget what he has done. Verse 9 says it, that after the Lord had brought them out of Egypt, they forgot the Lord their God. And this is why we heard yesterday that Samuel took a stone in chapter 7. He called its name Ebenezer, or the stone of help, and said, till now the Lord has helped us. In other words, let's give the credit where the credit is really due. It wasn't your strategy. It wasn't your military strength. It wasn't your influence that helped you. It was the Lord and Him only. And He has been with us all the way. 
So let's go back to chapter 12, and I want to read from verse 13. We're picking up on Samuel's farewell address here. And here's what the word of the Lord says. Samuel says, And now, behold the king whom you have chosen, for whom you have asked. Do you know that the name Saul means prayed for, asked for? That's what his name means. Behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you and your king. Now, therefore, stand still and see this great thing that the Lord will do before your eyes. Is it not wheat harvest today? The wheat harvest was the driest season of the year. I will call upon the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord, and asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called upon the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord, your God. Everybody say, your God. That we may not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil, to ask for ourselves a king. And Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord. But serve the Lord with all your heart, and do not a turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart, for consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, you shall be swept away, both you and your king, remembering the great things that God has done. And my main point is this today. God is gracious to his people, so we must remember the great things he has done and respond with faithful servant. Let's pray. God, as we come to you again today, tonight, speak, O Lord, until your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God is gracious to his people, so we must remember the great things he has done and respond with faithful service. Uh, when I say gracious, I don't mean courteous and just nice. It's divine grace. It's the benefits of a right relationship with God, even though we've not earned the right to it. It is unmerited favor from the God of the universe. And there are three points that we ought to remember from this text about the great things that God has done. There are number one, remembering God's grace in repentance. <clears throat> and then number two, remembering God's grace in his covenant. And number three, remembering God's grace in service. First point, remembering God's grace in repentance, we see in verses 19 through 21. In verse 18, God gives them this sign to remind them that God's presence is still with them. God, he sends thunder and he sends rain in the wheat harvest time. As I mentioned, it's the driest time of the year. It's a true miracle, and the people are terrified. They greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. They knew that they were wrong in asking for a king like all the other nations. In effect, they are, they are saying, God, we don't need you. We need someone else. And because of their sin and because of this demonstration by God, they figured that they are going to die in God's presence. So they confess their sin before Samuel and before God. Verse 19, all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil to ask for ourselves a king. 
So they now see their sin so clearly where they did not see it before, and they regret it. Have you ever been there where you've seen now your sin clearly, and you have regret? But to be frank, this is not a true and complete repentance. They make a confession, yes, but what's missing? They want Samuel to pray, but they have not backed down their request for a king. In other words, they haven't said, you know what, God, after we saw the display that you just did, you know what we said about a king? Never mind, never mind, never mind. We don't want a king anymore. We're good with you and Samuel. They didn't say that. So it's an incomplete, it's an insincere repentance, even though it's a step in the right direction. And and what's all also missing? What's also missing is an acknowledgement of their God's personal relationship with them. Later in verse 2, it says that it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Because here's the thing, God considers himself to be their God, But they look at Samuel and they say, pray to the Lord, your God. Have any of you, you all have any any couples that might be here when you have children and you have a child that is probably more like your spouse and when they misbehave, you look at them and say, talk to your child. Oh, that's just my family. (laughs) Verse 22, it's pleased to Lord to make you a, a people for himself. Samuel, talk to your God, even though God has shown them enough for them to respond to him based on his love towards them. All they know to do is to respond to him in fear of his wrath. And if I was God, I would wait on them to get all of this right before I even reply to them. But I want you to look at how gracious our God is. Verse 20, Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You have done all of this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Heart. Samuel reminds Israel that although they've chosen wrong and in an evil manner they have asked for a king, but the Lord is not done with them. God is not looking to destroy them. And once again, they fundamentally misunderstand their relationship with God, but rather they don't understand God's relationship to it, them. Because, listen, understand that even in the Old Testament here, the heart of God's message to his people is not just obey me or be destroyed. That is not the heart of God. It's please understand my love for you. Please understand my grace for you and follow me. Don't fall into the trap of believing that any part of Any path apart from following me, any idol, any other God is willing to save you. Remember what they did to you? They tried to enslave you. They tried to destroy you. But I am your God. You are my people. Remember what I have done for you. And this is why Samuel is able to say, don't be afraid. Why? Because there is hope. And and don't turn aside after empty things that cannot profit or deliver for they're empty. There's hope in turning to God. There is no hope in turning to anything else. Nothing else can substitute for God in your life. No one else can love you. No one else can heal you. No one else can deliver you. No one else can give you peace of mind. No one else can give you a new heart. No one else can give you joy. No one else can redeem our life from destruction and make us a new person. No one else but the God who loves you and wants to be gracious to you. So every time we remember how sinful we are, remember how good God is. And come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy to help you in your time of need. God doesn't want us hiding in shame. He doesn't want us running from him. He wants us running toward him. 
approach your Father through Jesus Christ the Son, not out of fear of God's wrath, but out of an acknowledgement of His grace. God wants to give grace when you repent. So remember God's grace even in your repentance. I love this quote from Bill Thrall. He says, when grace introduces us to repentance, the two of us become fast friends. But when anything else introduces us to repentance, it feels like the warden has come to lock us up. But when grace gets involved, the truths of repentance reveal a fabulous world of life, freeing beauty. God wants to set you free. So never run from him. Always run toward him. That's why uh, the song says, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. Hallelujah. The hour I first believed. We remember the great things that God has done for us by remembering his grace to us in repentance. And point number two, remembering God's grace in his covenant. In his covenant, God made several covenants with the ancestors of the nation of Israel and with the nation of Israel itself over the years. God made covenants with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with David, with us. Uh, in the Baker Encyclopedia of the Bible, as a co covenant is an arrangement between two parties involving mutual obligations, especially the arrangement that established the relationship between God and his people, expressed in grace first with Israel and then with the church. So there are mutual obligations. If you will, then I will. If you will, then I will. But what did our God do? Starting with Abraham, God recognizes and he demonstrates that he knows that we will never be able to keep our end of the covenant. So if you recall, God put Abraham to sleep and he performed the ceremony by himself. I don't even expect you to fulfill your part of the covenant, though you may try. He will always keep his end of the covenant. God's covenant comes with grace. So verse 20, Samuel said to the people, do not be afraid. You've done all this evil, yet don't turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Now listen to this. I mentioned it before, for the Lord will not forsake his people. For his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. This was not new to the people. They can recall how God spoke to them on the mountain in Exodus chapter 19. God said to them, you, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation notice that God did not give them a commandment first God first told them look at what I did for you I brought you out of Egypt God's covenant is his greatest gift to his people we often think of God's covenant the ten commandments in the many ways that it it obliges us to him. If, if I do these things, then God will do these things for me. But God has allowed his covenant to oblige him to us in a way that could only be called grace. And some of you may say, well, listen, God is God. So God is not obligated to us in any way. That might be so unless he decides to. Unless he says, you're my people. 
You're my people. You're my man. You're my lady. You're my child. You're my person. And when he does that, nothing can change it. Nothing can change it. We like to say that we will not turn back. But God has said, I will not turn back. For his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself, the Lord will not forsake his people. God reminds us time and time again of his goodness towards us so that we're running toward him, never away from him. Even in our times of deep doubt, even in our times of sin, Eugene Peterson writes this commentary on verses 20 through 22. He says, do not be afraid. Yes, you have sinned, but don't let your sin paralyze you with guilt. Don't let your sin dupe you into thinking that you are irredeemable. Don't for a minute suppose that God has called it quits on you. It's God's business to save you. And God is not giving up. Lift your hands and just give God thanks. The last point I want to make is remembering God's grace and service. God is gracious to his people, so we remember the great things he has done and respond with faithful service. First of all, recall that Samuel demonstrated that he was faithful in his service. That's what he was telling them in his final speech. It's the pleasure and the privilege of those whom God has called to lead God's people to do so faithfully. And that's why Samuel says in verse 23, Moreover, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, and I will instruct you in the good and right way. They just wanted Samuel to pray for them in that moment so that they wouldn't die. That's what they wanted. Samuel, pray to the Lord your God so that we don't die. Samuel says, no, 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 no. I have a mandate from God to intercede for you and to teach you the right way to serve God. You didn't hire me. You can't fire me. I am doing what God has called me to do. I'm not just going to pray for you right now. He says, I will not cease to pray for you and to instruct you. Because if I cease to pray for you and to instruct you, for me, that would be sin. These elders who are sitting before you today, congregation, they have already committed themselves, not because of what we're doing here tonight, but because they have a mandate from God. By God's grace, they will not cease to pray for you and to instruct you in the word of the Lord. They will not cease studying the word of God so they're faithful in their instruction from this pulpit all the way to the hospital room, all the way to the, the small group meeting, all to the way to under, underneath a tree, all the way to the Sunday school class. Because to truly consider the great things that God has done for us, we need leaders who will teach us those great things. Elders, it is your mandate to preach and teach the Word of God faithfully in all the venues that this congregation may be found in so that they may be able to disciple one another, build one another up, through the truths of the Word of God. And deacons, it's your responsibility to assist the elders with the care of God's church so that the felt needs of the people are not neglected, 
and so that the elders are able to do what God has called them to do. We need the Word of God taught to us and demonstrated before us by these leaders because not everything that God says to us in His Word is readily apparent to us. To learn the great things that God has do uh, done for us from God's Word, many times it has to be taught through those whom God has appointed. Six years ago, Many of us knew that God gave us grace, but what we may not have known until we were taught from the Word of God is that God's grace extended to us even before we were born. We may have known that because we were following Jesus, we were destined to live a life with Him forever in heaven, but until we were taught we may not have known that we were predestined by God from the before the foundations of the world to be his son and his daughter for all eternity. And so we're taught, and because we are taught from day to day consistently, we can now remember. So finally, as we are considering remembering God's grace in faithful service, Samuel says, only fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. Serving God faithfully means considering his goodness regularly. Uh, another way to say this, Lee Eckloff gave this quote where he says, remembering and considering what great things God has done for you is is to reorient all of your memories around God's work in your life individually and in our lives corporately. To look at everything that God is doing, knowing that God has purpose to work all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Amen? Amen. So six years in, so many things are still new to so many of us. But I want you to know that by God's grace, we're not going to let it become routine. What God has done here among us, we don't want to let it be routine. It is a great thing that God has done to give me brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I, I remember just being so impacted by the Grace Workshop Ministries when you all would get up and greet one another. I've been to churches where they say, we're going to have a time of fellowship, and they greet one another, and people just look at each other and say, praise the Lord, and sit back down. But, but I remember, and I think you all still do this, we would take some time, and you would find somebody and give them the longest hug and let them know how much you appreciate them. That is a great thing that has God has done for you. Don't ever let it become routine. Put down the landmarks. Remember the ways that God has blessed you. Remember the journey that God has brought you through. Look even at the hard times and say, even though those hard times were giving us a lot of anxiety and headache, God has not just kept us there. He has brought us through, and I remember where God has brought us from and where he has brought us to. Amen? Amen. That's why this six-year jubilee celebration is so important. We remember that God has fought every battle for us. We remember that God is the one who promised and he has faithfully brought it to pass. We reflect on how many people uh, have come to and through this ministry and they've come to know the Lord more faithfully, to know the Lord's character and to know, know his nature and to know his love for you and to know his grace for you. So many of have experienced a rebirth almost, as it were. And we begin to following Jesus by putting our faith and trust in him and him alone for salvation. We remember God's grace and repentance. We remember God's grace 
in his covenant, and we remember God's grace in faithful service.